And good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for coming out to our seminar today, our live seminar today on sustainability and how do you maintain your motivation. I am Kevin Richardson, the founder of Naturally Intense. I'd like to introduce my stellar team. This is Erica Citrin. Good morning, guys. Thank you for coming out. And this is Tiffany Mangus. Hello, good morning, everyone. And today we're going to be talking, you know, about several different subjects, but one of the things that's really important uh, for all of us whenever we have a seminar is that we have a portion put aside for your questions. So we're going to talk a little bit about motivation, how to maintain motivation, how to, you know, stay on your diet, how to keep on training when it feels like you really don't want to keep on doing it. And you know, we're also going to give you some tips as to what you can do to make sure your training doesn't flag or lag. You don't have that too much of an up and down. It's pretty much more steady. And we're going to talk about our experiences and we're going to invite you as much as possible to, you know, feel free to have any questions that you have towards the end of the seminar and, you know, ask them. We're going to try to get through as many questions as possible. Um, the only bad question is the question you don't ask. So we're always more than happy to hear all the questions. Um, so to start, I think what has happened over the past, um, one word has become very popular over the past, I'd say decade or so, is the word sustainability. So, you know, we hear about it's really important for the environment that what we do creates a sustainable, um, sustainable earth. We talk about sustainable practices. You know, in businesses, sustainability is something that people are talking about a lot more in terms of having a business is going to last long term. But what we don't really hear in today's world is sustainability in exercise or sustainability in diets. How do you maintain a diet? There's all the new diets that come out. There's the keto diet, there's the intermittent fasting, there's the raw diet, there's the, the grapefruit diet. You know, there are all these truly, from my point of view, bizarre, you know, kind of temporary modalities that people use to get into better shape, but there's not much talk about what you can realistically do to stay in shape or to get in shape and stay in shape long term. And I think in some ways, I'm going to start by, you know, taking some of the blame for it. You know, most people on social media, magazines, television, you see the bodybuilders or you see the fitness stars, people on Instagram who are in really, really fantastic shape. And we look to them, look to us as a source of inspiration, a source of, well, what can I do to look like that? You know, you see the picture with the rippling abs, you know, you see the muscles, you see the tight waist, you see that physique that you really and truly would love to have yourself. And you tell yourself, well, I'm going to do what they do, whatever they're doing, I'm going to try to do. But the problem is that I'm going to be very honest in the physique and fitness industry, sustainability is not a word that's, 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 that's arrived yet. Most competitors, if not, you know, the majority of them or anybody who looks really, really great for photographs usually will go through a very extreme um, process of both diet and exercise. It usually involves a ton of aerobics, a ton of training, and it involves very low calories. And it might be low carb, it might be intermittent fasting, it might be liquid diet. It can be, I mean, I've heard and seen all, all types, but the end result tends to be the same. They lose body fat, look fantastic. They take the photo shoots, they take the photographs in the photo shoot, they go up on stage, they win the competition, they do some pictures for social media. And the public gets this impression that that's what they look like all the time. And so that I'm gonna do what they do. And then they kind of buy into their own mythology as well in terms of thinking that they are experts in terms of how to help people sustainably stay in fantastic shape whereas that's not really something that they do if you saw most people who are let's say either bodybuilders fitness competitors bikini competitors or even somebody on instagram who really got into great shape for some photographs if you see them a week or two after a, a shoot or a peak event they look sometimes unrecognizable. 
but those aren't the pictures that you see. And if you do see those pictures, it doesn't go with the message, the message which is supposed to be about sustainability. What can you do to realistically lose weight, get into better shape and stay there? We don't really talk about that. All we talk about is what you can do to lose weight, what you can do to build muscle, what you can do to lose weight, what you can do to build muscle. And I think somewhere in there, we lose that important narrative of the fact that it's not easy to do it, but because it's not easy, doesn't mean we should not talk about it. You know, we like to talk about our strengths. You know, if you're really, really good at doing one particular thing, that's pretty much what you're going to talk about most of the time. You're not going to talk about things you're not that good at. And almost all human beings that I've ever come across in the Western world struggle with maintaining the diet. They struggle with having the motivation to keep on training. They struggle with trying to find a balance between, you know, really getting into to great shape and being able to stay that way. So many of us, I'm sure, you know, um, out there in our audience, know people or themselves have the experience of, well, when I was younger, I'd train all the time, I'd eat well, I was really, really into it. And then time went on, life came around and kind of petered away. But it's usually taken upon the individual as some sort of a failure, like I didn't do something correctly, as opposed to that's just kind of how it is. But no one says that's how it is. No one says, well, you know, I'm in great shape right now, but I'm pretty sure I will not be in great shape 10 years from now. Or I'm in great shape right now, but after this photo shoot, after this competition, I'm not going to look anything like this. But at the same time, those are the people we still look to in terms of what you should be doing to get into shape. And those are all temporary, very, very temporary matters, which are really more of a way of trying to find a solution to what is perceived as a problem. People see body fat as a problem. They see not being in fantastic shape as a problem. It's a temporary solution. It's not a solution at all because it doesn't really talk about lifestyle or sustainability. Although the word lifestyle is very often kind of thrown around as a catchphrase in a marketing phase, but it's not easy. And the reason why we don't talk about it is because it's hard. It's not easy. It's, um, it's a lifetime of falling on your face, a lifetime of feeling completely and utterly frustrated with um, trying to go forward and a lifetime also of doubt. You know, people look at someone like myself. I've had a pretty good career as a natural bodybuilder. Um, you know, you have a following, you have a, a, a certain reputation, you've done so much in the fitness industry and you have a particular look and they see me where I am now and they don't realize the struggle that it took to kind of get there. And if anybody, you know, either reads my blogs or follows on Instagram, I'm very open about the fact that it was not easy. It's, it's, it's not easy. It gets easier as you go along, but it's never going to be really easy because you're doing something that's hard. You know, life is, most things in life that are worth accomplishing are hard. And I think that's kind of where things have to start in the conversation, that things are hard. It's not going to be easy. There's no magic pill. Well, I take that back. There actually are magic pills that you can take that will make you look fantastic and will make you build muscle and lose fat. But the consequences for using those things are not anywhere near the benefit that you get from losing a couple of pounds of body fat or building muscle. It's really not. Um, the natural way is always going to be the way. So today we're going to talk about what you can do to do to create something sustainable. And I'll start with you know, my experience and I'll talk over, look over to Erica and, and Tiffany and they'll talk a little bit about, about theirs. And I will start not plugging high intensity training at all, but it's part of my story. When I started bodybuilding, I was training six days a week for an hour, hour and a half. And the results were, they were mediocre at best. They weren't really Terrific. And again, I started up at 125 pounds. I wasn't naturally a big guy. I was training as hard as I could. But I came to an understanding by the time I was about 15, which is very, very early and just about a year into my training, that there was no way I was doing this for the rest of my life. Like I knew, I knew for a fact that I was not going to be in the gym six days a week for the rest of my life. Like I'm not doing that. 
and developing what I developed, which is a series of really high intensity training workouts that last 10, 15 minutes, was an experiment that worked. And if it didn't work, I would tell you very honestly that I would not be here. I would not be a bodybuilder. I would not have biceps. I would not look anything the way I look because it was, it was painful for someone like myself who has such a wide and varied number of interests and things in life that I love and would like to do to spend an hour and a half in a gym six days a week. That's just, it was just way too much. It wasn't something that was sustainable. So I think for me personally, the fact that my workouts probably never go over 20, 25 minutes max. We're talking max here. Um, and it's just three times a week was really key in my ability to be able to keep on doing this. And, you know, we've had literally, we've trained literally thousands of people over the past 30 years of, of my career and 30 years of the existence of naturally intense as well. And that's kind of what people tend to keep on saying that it's so short that the brevity of it allows them to fit into their life schedule and become something of a regular occurrence. Um, but that being said, it's not easy. It's hard. And there's a bit of a trade-off for that. You're not training six days a week, training three days a week because you're trying to give your body enough time to rest. But in so doing, you're training to the point where you really can't go anymore. So you're sore all the time. So you're, you know, you're going to really feel the workouts. The workouts are difficult. And you have to find the motivation to kind of get through that. Um, I have a thousand things that I've done and do over the past, you know, 30 years of my training this way that helped me get through. One of them, which is very much um, an important one, is remembering what my initial motivation was. Whenever I feel like I don't really want to go to that workout, and that does happen, not very often, but especially over, over the years, it happened a lot more when I was younger than it does now, but I would always kind of think back and remember where I came from, what started it. And I think about that little boy who I was reading comic books and how those comic books inspired me. Or I would think about the first time I saw Arnold Schwarzenegger um, in the Terminator movie and how much it inspired me. Or I would think about uh, the first bodybuilder I ever actually met, the first professional bodybuilder I ever met and how inspiring that was. And I put music on and, you know, that reminds me of those times. I'll put soundtracks for, you know, superhero movies when I'm training. I wear superhero outfits all the time, like literally all the time, because it's all part of what I do to try to maintain that, that connection to that fired up little kid that started my routine. And I think for a lot of people, if you could find and remember where that spark came from, why do you want to work out? What was it? that real dream you had, how old were you? What was it? And try and find a way to filter that. That's, it's really, really important. It's a small ember that you want to nurture into a big flame, but always want to remember where that ember came from and do things to enhance it. So yes, I look like a 12, like very tall 12 year old, but it's really motivating and helped me with my workouts. Um, unlike, you know, most people who have a trainer. I don't have a trainer. I have me. So I need to generate some sort of a crazy thing to keep myself going and then keep everybody else going as well. And this is part of my kind of my mythology and what I've done. Um, and I'm going to pause on the exercise and the training part there because I think I want to hear a little bit from, from my team, my stellar team, about what they do and how they find a way to be sustainable with their exercise. So, Erica, we'll start with you. It's so funny that when we talk about what gets us motivated, my mind went back to this girl I knew in high school, and her name was Katie, and she was a gymnast, and she would make biceps. She could flex because she was just so strong from doing that sport that she did, and I was so fascinated with it. And, and Kevin just talking right now kind of reminded me of that moment when I was just like, I want that. 
And I didn't really know what it was I wanted. I certainly wasn't going to go start gymnastics um, to achieve that. And I didn't know how to achieve that, but it would be many years later on moving to New York that I would eventually meet Kevin and kind of find this way into this life. And <clears throat> when we're talking about sustainability, I think we really need to go into the definition of what it truly means to be healthy. And sustainability, if you're talking about the earth, how do, how do we create a healthier earth so we can live on it longer? How do we create a healthier body so we can live in it longer? And going back to Kevin talking about what we see on social media a lot of these days is if you're looking at all these people and what they're doing doesn't add up to that longevity in their life, what is the point? You know, when we first started doing bodybuilding competitions, I would look at competitors and I would look at former competitors. And some of them would have these honestly very discouraging posts where they talked about their experience and how they were starving. They were miserable. Um, they'd never felt worse in their life. They lost muscle mass to get ready to go on stage for a bodybuilding competition. And something in that didn't add up in my head. So when I first did my first competition, Kevin had me start prepping maybe six months out, maybe longer. And I kept asking him, when is the big change going to happen? When is the big change going to happen? Like, when am I going to like drop down? Like I've been reading about all of this, like when am I going to really suffer? And it never really happened quite like that because the way that we are brought into the program and the way that we are taught to begin is the way that we are taught to continue for the entirety of the time. When I moved into the bodybuilding category and I was eating cans of tuna and broccoli for almost every meal, yeah, I suffered a little bit. But it was so close to how I lived my everyday life tuna instead of eggs, tuna instead of maybe cooked fish with olive oil, that I realized things weren't so bad. And what many people would see as these extreme limitations are really just a way of eating that I find to be simpler than agonizing over a restaurant menu or a cookbook or whatever posts you find on social media of this new superfood or article and it simplified everything it it made being healthy seem and feel a lot easier and i think you know i'm almost contradicting kevin and saying that because he talks about how hard it can be how hard it is um which it is hard but I think it's hard because you're going against what so many people in society are talking about and posting about. And again, referencing back to Kevin, it's not, this side of the story is not talked about enough. You know, the fact that it is possible. And it sounds crazy, but only because there are so few people that truly do it. And you see Kevin as, this truly exemplary example, two fun words right there, um, put together, of that possibility come to life, you know? And we've talked before, if you were able to come to that last seminar, I mentioned, you know, Kevin grew up in Trinidad versus growing up in a place like the United States where he wasn't exposed to a lot of the different foods that we were probably exposed to growing up here. And for me, that definitely made adjusting more difficult, you know, being exposed to different levels of fast food and the American obsession with, you know, with food itself. There is an obsession with good food here that I think doesn't exist in a lot of um, other places and potentially other cultures. Um, and so while I think and again, I say I think because this may be a personal opinion. And so while I think it may be harder based off of where you grew up and the examples that you grew up around to eat a certain way, I think at the same time, if we put less attention towards 
what we're used to and more attention towards, well, what do you really want? It will be easier to find that healthy and sustainable path that we talk about and that we really want. And I don't know if Tiffany has anything to add to all of my rambling, but I'd love to hear what she has to say as well. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that was awesome. First off, uh, my experience is uh, really different than both Kevin and Erica in the in the way that I feel like my journey was more weight loss versus theirs was more muscle gain just based on our body types. And I think it's good to hear all the different perspectives because we all have different bodies. So there's people that struggle with gaining muscle. There's people that struggle with losing weight. There's people that struggle with both. For me, um, I was, now I don't want to, I, I don't think I was ever like truly extremely overweight, but there was always like a little extra, you know, that like skinny fat thing that people talk about. <laughs> that was me. Um, and when I was in college is when I basically hit the end of my rope. I was like, this is not going to work for me anymore because of my, my personal career path, which was, um, which is musical theater. Um, Erica's a dancer as well, so she knows how how important being fit in this industry is. And I fell in love with fitness through that. Ever since then, I didn't go back. But um, my journey with that was very interesting because I actually did try out all the different fads, all the different diets, all the different workouts to see what would work. And yes, I did lose the weight. I did lose it, but it was really hard for me to keep it off. And I still never received the muscle tone that I was looking for. I wanted to look like, like what Kevin was saying, all these Instagram fitness models, all of these things. I'm like, well, I'm working out three hours a day, every single day. How do I not look like that? I'm like lowering my calorie intake to like a thousand calories a day. And that it's just like seemed insane how I didn't still see the, those sort of results. Um, and it wasn't until Kevin's training that I, I was able to find that. And with going along with what Erica said, growing up in the United States, it can be really hard, especially I grew up in the South. So like, we really like some good food. Uh, <laughs> but I also think that a big Bit, what's also been really helpful for myself and what I think can help other people as well with staying motivated and creating sustainability is not looking for one overall end result. Kind of like what Erica was saying is like, when am I going to see this? When am I going to see this? When do I drop down? Where do I like lose, cut back and lose all this weight immediately? And now I have all these shredded lines, but instead like creating small goals along the way to end up being what what you want to look like at the end or what you want to feel like what sort of take you want your body's path to go along um because that i think creates sustainability instead of saying i'm going to lose 25 pounds and then you're gonna you can lose 25 pounds today tomorrow the next day like you if you stop eating of course anyone can do that but now can you keep that off is that is really the goal to lose 25 pounds and then gain it back in two months? I don't think so. So really, I think it's creating small goals along the way and then keep adding to that. Maybe now you've lost that 25 pounds. What's the next step? Like, oh, maybe it's like, I want to learn how to do a handstand or just creating small goals and then keep creating them. So that way you're never reaching that end of the line where you fall back and you're like, oh, well, I did everything I wanted to do. So now now I'm now I'm done. Now I'll just go back to being overweight or losing losing all my muscle mass, whatever it is for you. But that's what it was helped me a lot is continuously trying to have some sort of goal in mind to fight towards personally. And I'll turn it back over to you, Kat. Um, Tiffany, I just want to ask really quick because I think this would be very interesting. When you say that you've tried all the different diets, what I want to know is when you started one and then ended, what caused you to try another one? Like what kept you going through that cycle? Um, honestly, to see what would, what would work long term for me. There were certain things that honestly did work and they worked for months. And I was like, I can keep doing this if I want to. Really restricting my calorie count. Honestly, I did see results. I restricted them like crazy. Of course, I'm going to see results. But it's like then I would crave everything that I'm completely cutting out of my life, whether it was 
carbs with a keto diet, like completely eliminating carbs in general. And then the next couple months, I would need to eat a whole pizza just because I'm like craving the fact that I've cut all carbs out of my life. Um, so then I'd be like, okay, well, that didn't really work. So let me try something else. And then I think that's also what happens in general is we want to figure out what works best with us. And there's so much information on the internet now. It's like, it's, it's a blessing and a curse, right? That we can learn at this, like the click of a like click of a button, we can learn everything there is to know based off of a ton of scientists research. But is that really a blessing when you don't know which way to turn? So it's just continuously trying to see what works. And I think that's where a lot of people are having struggles and having issues. It's like, okay, great, it does work, but for how long? And that's where I think our training and our, what we do with our nutrition and everything like that really is different is because it's not something that's so restrictive or so crazy or so out of like the ordinary. It's just working something that you can continue doing for today, tomorrow, next year, something that you can create a really truly healthy lifestyle and not just like a healthy month or two. I think that, that, um, that was both of you guys, that was absolutely awesome. But, you know, to Tiffany's point, it's, it's so much harder today to be able to get into good shape than it was back in my time. And I remember when I started personal training, um, this is back in Trinidad, we're talking, God, 30 years ago. Everyone who came in, they knew exactly why they gained weight. I mean, literally, I would do consultations with clients about their diet. And they'd say, oh, yeah, I'm eating this, I'm eating that, I'm eating this, I'm eating that, and that's getting me fat. I take this out, that out, this out, that, and I'll be okay. And you're like, yeah, that's it. Because there wasn't this plethora of information. The internet didn't exist. There were magazines, but, you know, in the islands, people didn't read magazines as much as people probably over here in the U.S. did. And it wasn't, weight loss wasn't as much of a cultural um, ideal, if we say, in the islands for us. And bodybuilding was really more of a tradition. So you'd have people who were successful at it, who were trainers, who were um, professionals, and they would tell you what to do. You'd go to the gym and they'd tell you what to do, tell you what to eat. And most of my initial knowledge came from just being this kid, listening to what I was told to do. They say, do this, do that, do this, do that. And that's it. You, just, you didn't listen to anyone else. You just follow what they said. And it was pretty simple. And some of those guidelines worked, some of those guidelines didn't work. But what I, what I did learn, I did learn, you know, as a bodybuilder, how to master having someone lose weight quickly, rapidly. Um, I mean, truly mastered it. But it was something that I myself had to reject because at the end of the day, like Tiffany was saying, when you restrict your calories to a certain degree, you know, you are a human being and your body doesn't know that you're restricting your calories because you're trying to get a six pack. All it knows is that something is wrong, food sources are low, so your sleep gets affected, your energy levels are horrible, and your motivation to eat becomes all consuming. Um, I think I'm very open about talking about back in the days when I was competing and my first bodybuilding competition where I went from 252 pounds to 211 pounds uh, within the course of exactly 12 weeks. And the eating frenzy that came afterwards was indescribable. I mean, it's, you know, I have friends who, when they meet me up, meet, meet up with me today, will talk about, Kevin, remember that time when you were just eating pound cakes and, you know, buckets of Kentucky Fried Chicken and, you know, it, and it, 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 it came to a point where it was absurd. And I think that's why I'm so, you know, insisting on talking about it all the time that it's a little bit absurd. It's, it's this crash. You do tons of cardio. You do, well, we didn't do cardio at all. I've never done cardio in my life, but you just drop your diet, you drop your calories and you do all this carb manipulation and everything else. And as a natural bodybuilder for me, Natural bodybuilding is about trying to find a way to get into 
exceptionally good shape without using anabolic steroids or any form of drugs. And you're trying to find the healthy fat, yet at the same time, you know, when you get to a point where the reason why you look the way you look is because you pretty much starved yourself harder than anybody else would. And that's what gave you that look on stage. And then you lose it literally within a couple of weeks. That was not something that I wanted to teach and it wasn't something I wanted to live. And so I made sure of all of my competitors, anybody I worked with, and my own personal journey became about making sure it was sustainable. And there's one story about sustainability that I will share, which really did cement my path in terms of sustainable eating for everyone who I work with. I had a client who came to me and his whole life, he wanted to be a bodybuilder, he wanted to compete, he had competed before and he wanted to do a competition and he was 205 pounds. And he said he wanted to compete in a non drug tested competition. So against guys who are using drugs and he wanted to compete as a lightweight. Now the lightweight cutoff for him was 152 and a half, 150 pounds and a half. And he had, of course, magic 12 weeks. And I said, I, I flat out said, no, in fact, we wasted an entire week because we did it in 11 weeks. I we spent, not wasted an entire week, but I spent an entire week saying, no, I'm not going to help you do this. 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 He was insistent. It was a lifelong dream for him. And I said, you know what? If you're going to do everything I tell you to do before and after the competition, I'll agree to help you, you know, get in shape for the competition. He agreed. And 11 weeks later, he was 152 and a quarter pounds. He was a quarter pound under the, the weight limit. He came second against guys who were on drugs. He looked the best he ever did in his entire life. And afterwards, he was supposed to have come to the gym on the contest on a Saturday. He was supposed to be back to the gym with me on Monday to start helping him transition back into regular eating. He wasn't there and it didn't end well for him at all. He put all the weight back on and it triggered a horrible, um, he had a complete breakdown as a result, um, result of seeing essentially his body, you know, lose everything that he had before. And he was never really able to get back into that shape. And that was one of the saddest and lowest points of my career, because I was part of that whole um, movement that all the bodybuilders were doing, everyone was doing. But at the end of the day, when someone comes to me as a trainer, as a coach, I'm there to help them enhance their lives. And my job is when, if you're with me for a week, if you're with me for 10 days, if you're with me for a year, 10 years, you should walk away with having something better in your life for having worked with me. And I didn't feel that with this particular client. I felt that's not what I'm going to do. That's not what I'm about. And so over the years, I probably turned down more competitors than I accepted because whenever I heard the, oh, well, you know, I need to get into shape for this competition and it's going to be in six weeks. Can you help me? The answer is no, absolutely not. And, you know, it's easy to turn clients down now, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be where I am, very successful personal trainer, very successful nutrition coach. Turning down one client isn't going to make or break our budget. And, you know, not going to change much of our income because we have so many at this point. But back then, things were not that easy. Every one client who I turned down meant that it would be a struggle, you know, to make all the bills, to make the rent, everything else when I was just starting off. But it was a decision I had to make and a, a way I had to go forward with. And I think that with Erica and Tiffany, you know, can attest that I will never have anyone do anything extreme. You know, I don't believe in 
using supplements. I don't believe in, you know, cardio. I don't believe in, you know, sub thousand um, calorie diets. I don't believe in zero carbs because you don't need it. And the problem goes down to that whole idea that if you just eat unprocessed foods and you stick with it long enough, you'll be okay. You'll look pretty darn good and that's good enough. Um, so Erica, you know, both Erica and Tiffany have also, you know, as trainers and as coaches, we have the chance to touch people's lives. And we, I think we all share that, that sense of when we touch someone's life, we want to really make sure we do our best, put our best foot forward, we make sure that they're okay. We make sure that they're not going to be one more disgruntled person who says, well, I look great for, you know, for a couple of days, I'll never look like that again. And they get in such a depression and such a, a downward spiral that they completely lose it as opposed to someone who looks good, but took years to get there. And when they look good, that's not how they look for a week or two weeks or 10 weeks. It's just how they look. And I think that's, that's really what we try to do, but let's hear from, you know, hear from them in terms of, you know, what, what they think. And, um, you know, maybe Tiffany, you start. Sure. In terms of what, what are we um, discussing now? Which topic are we, are we doing the long-term dietary success? Yeah. Like what, what, what would you say that's, that's, so important in terms of long-term dietary success for you? Uh, I think honestly not uh, going along with what you said and something I touched upon earlier is not completely cutting out something in general as far as I'm so sorry that's my dog she's she's gonna interrupt here and there <laughs> but uh, I think like you said when you completely cut out at something like carbs or like I can only eat like 500 calories a day when you restrict so heavily there's just no way for you to create a long-term success with any sort of diet um if it's to the point where you are literally hungry all the time and that's how I felt personally is that I, I literally circled my day around food like I'm just hungry all the time and when when do I get to eat the next thing and what is going to fit in this sort of like calorie measurement that I can take. Um, so personally, I think it's finding the, the things that we discuss and what will work for each individual person and really creating that diet around your lifestyle, what you're looking to achieve and not completely saying that I have to do all of this to lose a certain amount of weight in a certain amount of time, but just trust that the results are gonna come. And a, Maybe it'll be three weeks, a couple months, six months, like if you're getting ready for a competition. But just trusting the results will come if you're staying consistent. Um, yeah, I think that's my personal take on it. Erica? Don't give up. And don't care so much what other people think. That's I I have ravaged myself and still will caring about what other people think. Kevin knows that all too well. And the reason I've been able to do this program is because I don't care what other people think. And I'm being very blunt and honest about it. I don't care if I'm the only one in the room with water in my hand instead of alcohol. I don't care if I'm the one eating a salad when everybody else is eating pizza. Um, sometimes you have to be a little selfish and not in a bad sense. I mean selfish in the sense of you're taking care of yourself. You know, it's that I'm sure we may have seen it online on Instagram, you know, you only got one body, so what are you gonna put in it? You gotta take care of it. Um, and I think that actually goes a long way. Um, I do wanna take a pause, because I think someone raised their, I think Kanisha, um, I'm so sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. 
I think she had a question. You had a question. Um, but if you want to post it in the chat, and Tanya, I think you just raised your hand. If you guys want to post any questions that you have along the way in the chat, we'll be able to address them there because I don't want you guys to forget. Um, so if you post them there, I'll be able to catch them and I can either bring them into the conversation or we will address them um, at the end of the seminar. But uh, Kevin, I would love to kind of go into if we already gave tips um, into, you know, making your fitness program and, you know, for an individual who maybe can't do personal training or who is starting off and needs this to be a solo journey. Um, how do you start? What do you do? I think the first thing you do is you um, stop listening. There's a lot of noise out there and it's very difficult to, to hear what your body is saying, which is all that matters. What you see on Instagram, what you read on bodybuilding.com, what you read on the forums, all those things. You know, sometimes there's really fantastic information on there, and sometimes really bad information on there. But I think it can be a little bit of a distraction in terms of being able to really listen to your body. And there's, as far as exercise and training is concerned, it's about getting into a routine. It's about getting into a routine and seeing exercise not as always has to be this, you know, fantastic and wonderful and great experience that we have to post on Instagram while we're doing it, but just something that's so mundane, like brushing your teeth. It should really be something that you just do it. You don't think about it. You know, I train three days a week and I think the brevity of it, the frequency of it is important. I don't see any reason for anyone who, unless you're a marathon runner or some sort of a, an athlete, if you're trying to get into good shape, I know I'm just talking good shape. We're talking about, even if you want to be at the highest level of natural bodybuilding, there's no reason to train more than three days a week. And the first question that pops up there is, well, well, how come everyone else isn't training three days a week? And to answer that question, which is a really valid question, is again, let's be quiet. Let's not think about what everybody else is doing. We all use the QWERTY keyboard. The keyboards in front of us are all lined up to be optimized for typewriters because when keyboards were designed, people use typewriters. And typewriters, if anybody is old enough as I am to remember how they work, because most people aren't always as old as I am, I realize that at this point, you know, the keys would stick sometimes. And so they put it in a way where you could type not too fast so that the keys would stick together and it put certain keys further apart so you wouldn't have that problem. But as the years went by, we evolved. We had electric typewriters. And I remember electric typewriters as well before there were computers. Then we had computers. So we no longer need a QWERTY keyboard. In fact, the QWERTY keyboard is not the most efficient way to type. If you wanna type 100 words a minute, there are other keyboard designs that will work much better than the one that you're used to. And that's where we come into it. The fact that we use this keyboard is because this keyboard is part of our culture. And our culture is kind of like a, a sustained story that we all choose to believe in. But it's not science. It's not efficient. And it's not factual. There's a big difference between those two things. Just because for a long time, people looked up at the sun and saw the sun rise in the east and set in the west, they assumed that, okay, the sun revolves around the earth because that's what we see. And everybody, okay, we all agree, that's what it is. It took a lot. It took hundreds of years it, before people were able to accept the idea that, well, that's not exactly how it works because it's not what you actually saw. It's not what you're seeing all the time. The story had to change, but the story changing doesn't change the fact that the sun does not revolve around the earth. And the same goes with fitness. The same goes with your keyboard. There are better ways of doing it because in the fitness industry, people are so invested, just like the keyboards, totally invested in making it a certain way. It would be ridiculous to introduce to the general public a new keyboard where Get to start all over again. I mean, I can touch type. I can type. I haven't looked at the keyboard in decades. I can just totally do it. I have to start all over again. 
But if I did, I'd be faster, I'd be more efficient. I seriously considered, I've looked into getting more efficient keyboards. I just haven't been able to find, you know, a good enough one that, that was compatible with the programs and systems that I'm using, else I would have totally had one myself. But it kind of talks about the fact that we don't look at things from a scientific perspective. We just, oh, that's what everybody does. That's what we're going to do. So everybody does. That's what we're going to do. When we talk about the, the coronavirus vaccine by Moderna, they're able to give people half the dose and by giving them half the dose, people are having pretty much are able to have pretty much the same benefit in terms of protection against the coronavirus. Now, when they create vaccines, it's an arbitrary amount of vaccine based on what they always do when they create it. They didn't check in to see what the minimum dose was. They didn't do that. There's no need to do that. It's like, all right, we're going to do this. It's like water. How much water should you drink a day? Eight glasses a day. Where did that come from? Nowhere. Two guys at Harvard one day decided, you know, eight sounds like a good number. Okay, done. And then it became absorbed into our culture and our story in terms of, well, that's just how it is because that's how we've always done it. Does everyone need a glass of water a day? Absolutely not. If you're 205 pounds in the tropics or, you know, trekking through the desert, eight glasses of water a day isn't going to cut it. It's not that simple. It's really not that simple, but sometimes it is. And then we have to look a little bit outside the box and be a little bit like Erica says, you have to kind of not care what other people think, but think in terms of what's best for you. And I think what's best for every single person I've ever met is training less because it's more sustainable. The reason why we have a successful personal training uh, enterprise at this point is because our clients stick with us. They don't come to us for 10 weeks they don't come to us for three months. They come to us and they stay because it creates a way of training that's sustainable that gives you results. And sustainable results means long-term results. So I think the first thing you need to do to make sure your program is going to go be something you're doing a year, two years, 10 years, is take down the volume of your training. I will never get tired of your analogies. And this keyboard one is probably one of my favorites I've ever heard. Um, I think this is a great question because I think it segues into multiple things that we've already spoken of and can touch on more. So in terms of kind of going against what all those voices are screaming at us, and I think also our very last topic, you know, maintaining motivation. Um, our question was, so if cardio and no carbs is not important, what do you do in order to get the client burning fat and toning the loose skin and also getting down stubborn, stubborn belly and side fat? Um, I think maintaining motivation is really a big one because especially for those last two areas, those things take time, lots and lots of time. But I would love for you to talk about cardio and no carbs a little bit more, Kevin, if you don't mind, um, in terms sure. of putting that into play. Sure. Um, the human body is designed to adapt to whatever situation you put it in and try to be as best as possible to do that particular activity that it's doing we come from a, a past and our past has to be taken into consideration we don't live in a vacuum everything about how our body works is essentially an interaction an adaptation between the human body and our ancestral environment so everything about how our muscles get bigger how our body loses body fat all those really important things kind of come down to what we need to do to survive, what we need to do to stay safe, what we need to do to procure, to procure food. So that being said, our body is not a hybrid machine. It specializes. So if you do a lot of cardio, which most people do, most people do cardio, the most, and will always probably be as long as I'm alive, the most popular form of exercise involves cardiovascular exercise. You go for a run, you go for a jog, you go on the bike, you go on the treadmill, you go on the Stairmaster, you burn the fat. Now, if you train at a VO2 max of 70% over a 20 minute period, you do switch over from primarily using glucose as a fuel to using fat as a fuel. 
So therefore you start burning fat. But again, that's where it stops. That's where the science of it stops. Because there's a, a beautiful poem which talks about the importance of either you're gonna drink fully from the well of knowledge or don't drink at all. And a lot of what we take and what we hear in the fitness industry are small snippets of how our bodies work. It's not the full story. But those small snippets sell cardio equipment. Women love cardio compared to lifting weights in general. And if you're a gym owner and you want to have women coming in, you need to have the cardio machines. It's easy to sell tons and tons of Stairmasters, tons and tons of Peloton bikes. It's easy because something you can do on your own. It's very, very easy. Weight training is much more difficult, much more associated with, with a, a masculine um, form of exercise, which in itself is ridiculous because there's no such thing as gender and exercise. Human body works the same way. It's, it's absurd, but that's another story. But getting back to it, if you're doing an activity that needs fat to continue, your body compensates by storing more fat. It also compensates by getting rid of any extra tissue that might be slowing you down. So if you're running and you have pecs and biceps, which are all fantastic, this is not helping me run. So I'm gonna start losing it the more I run. You will literally see your biceps start shrinking. You'll see your pecs start shrinking. Some of your leg muscles even start shrinking because your body's trying to get lighter and it's gonna start getting a little fatter because it needs the extra fat to do the activity. So the practice of starving yourself, doing tons of cardio will make you lose weight. Absolutely, absolutely you will lose weight. But the problem is that you're also going to lose a lot of muscle. So you're not gonna get that look. And as far as carbohydrates are concerned, your body needs carbohydrates in order to maintain muscle. If you don't have enough carbohydrates coming in as fuel, your body says, well, we don't have enough carbs. Start using the other plentiful amount of, you know, tissue we have in our body as fuel in something called gluconeogenesis. You start breaking down muscle into a usable form of fuel. So you start losing muscle mass. And again, what about those people who, you know, in the magazines, online, on Instagram, they do all those things. Two things, number one, they have a lot of muscle to start off. They can afford to lose a lot of muscle. Most people don't have that. Number two, most of them use drugs. Not some of them, not all of them, most of them. The really impressive ones, almost all of them. The ones who we look to, look up to, almost all of them. The men and the women. They use drugs that allow them to do all those things and maintain muscle mass as they cut down. Now, if you eat a diet that's gonna be com Pose almost completely of high fiber, naturally occurring foods as your carbohydrate sources, you're not gonna eat that much of it. You know, what brand cereal is, you know, one of my top picks for a carb choice. There's only so much you can eat. You'll get just enough and you'll be okay. If you choose, um, you know, vegetables and, you know, other high fiber carb sources, there's only so much you can eat but you're also going to start limiting your, diet, your calorie intake naturally from doing that. And then combine that with a high intensity program to build muscle. The very act of building muscle requires energy. You'll burn more calories doing that as well. You put on muscle, the muscle, muscle is extremely metabolically active. The more muscle you have, the more calories you burn long-term, not instantly, long-term which is why someone like me can eat in excess of 3000 calories and still stay under 10% body fat because the more muscle you have, the more calories you can eat, which is the other thing about sustainability. The more muscle you build, the more you can eat and maintain equilibrium with your body weight. The less muscle you have, and if you do a, if you do a keto diet or you don't get enough calories, you can start losing muscle mass. So you're actually making your metabolism slower and slower which means the amount of food you need to eat has to keep on going down. So if you were eating, let's say 2000 calories before you started your keto diet, you crashed down, you lost 20 pounds, but out of those 20 pounds, you probably lost about 12, 15 pounds of muscle. If you start back eating 2000 calories, you're not going to go back to your initial weight. 
you'll put on weight, which is why most people after a diet like that put weight back on. And as far as skin tone is concerned, the more muscle you build, the more you have, you know, the filling out. If you just do cardio, you'll be a smaller version of yourself. So if you're flabby, you do a lot of cardio, you'll be smaller, but still flabby. If you're building muscle with high intensity training of adequate intensity and enough rest in, in between your, your time, you become a bigger muscle wise, not bigger. You're not going to be huge, not any other, but it's going to fill out. And you're also going to have a lot less problems with like, let's say excess skin as a result. And I hope that answered your question. And if we're like getting super specific into foods, we have a question about rice. Um, and I mean, I've had rice as part of my diet from you. Um, and we've even talked about, I even asked the question myself, you know, is, is brown rice better than white rice? Um, would you like to go into that? Because I think it's an interesting. Sure. I mean, rice is, white rice is not that high in fiber compared to something, let's say like oat bran or um, other more fibrous foods. But again, if you're eating it in moderation and you're eating it with, um, with protein, then you should be fine. And again, the idea to sustainability is about this really simple concept. You eat for what you're going to do, not what you did. So you had a hard day at work. You come home, you're really tired. You're like, man, I'm really tired, really stressed. Let me go have some carbs. Well, no, you already did the activity. Unlike a car, you can keep on, you, know, you put car, put gas in a car and don't use the car. You know, the gas has these wonderful thing called gas tanks that hold the fuel. Our bodies don't have gas tanks. We have muscles, which can hold some, you know, if in the form of glucose, we're eating a lot of carbs. It can hold some of that glucose inside the muscles. Some of it goes into your bloodstream, a lot of it goes to your brain, but the excess, we don't have you know, nice, convenient storage tanks, we have fat cells. Mm -hmm. So if we have too much at one time, and we're not doing anything with it, it's going to increase your body fat. So the idea is always eat for what you're going to do. Have your breakfast, large meal, lunch, slightly smaller meal, dinner, slightly smaller meal, taper it off as your activity goes off. On days you're training and you're active for lunch, make sure you have a little more carbs. Days you're not training, less active, eat more vegetables, have less carbs. Really that simple. Can you have rice in between that? Absolutely, you can have, you can pretty much, you can eat rice, no problem. I've eaten rice for decades. I don't eat it right now because one day I just decided, you know what, I don't feel for rice anymore. And that was about four years ago. Yeah. It just happened. So it's really about what you're eating. Ooh, I'm hearing myself in someone's screen. Um, so it's about what you're eating it with and then what activity are you preparing yourself for when you're eating? And I think this goes into yeah. your next question with, you know, what about an athlete? When I was in school for dance and I had started training with Kevin, my diet definitely had some more carbs in it. Um, I had rice included in my lunches almost every single day. I left dance school and I wasn't dancing almost six hours every single day, didn't need the rice anymore. And so even someone playing cricket, someone playing um, football, someone playing baseball, the same kind of goes. If you're gearing up to go to practice, you're probably going to need to prepare your body for something like that. But it's not meant for when you're coming home to go sit on the couch. Um, I think that's, you know, if you even want to talk about something like dessert, we don't need dessert but dessert is a very popular end of the day meal that people incorporate. And it's actually the worst possible time to be putting all of that sugar and fat in your body when you're about to go to bed. It's not going to, you know, the frivolous concept of, you know, burning off what you eat. I mean, there's nothing leaving your body at that point. You're going home and you're going to bed where your metabolic rate is going to be probably at its lowest, you know? Um, but with that being said, we are at time, but I do want to just, I don't want to end so abruptly. If anybody has any last minute questions, I want to give us, you know, 60 seconds to type those in. And then if Tiffany or Kevin, if you have any closing remarks or any last things. Okay, no, we, we have a couple more. We put the, initially the seminar was for an hour, but 
it, it ended up being amended to an hour and a half because people would have questions. So we actually oh, have cool. a half hour of um, half, we have a half hour of, of questions open to anybody else. So if anybody has any questions whatsoever, um, you know, we'd be more to more than likely to help answer them. One thing about bulletproofing your fitness program too that I want to just want to touch on. I am a personal trainer, so I it sounds a bit of like a like a bias in terms of talking about the importance of having a coach. I wouldn't be where I was, where I am. I wouldn't have gotten where I got to. I would have wouldn't have been able to come to a place to figure out the high intensity training that I eventually developed had I not had some truly, truly wonderful coaches. Um, I was a little kid in a gym in Trinidad and I was adopted by everyone. All the people who had been to the Olympics as Olympic lifters, all the gym instructors, they all were an immense part and my training partners over the years as well, they played an immense part in helping develop the person who would become the trainer and the coach that I am today. I would not be able to train as hard as I do had I not initially had those years of being taught how to train that hard. I wouldn't have been able to see what I was capable of had I not had such good mentorship people who could kind of look at you and say, all right, I can get you here. I can see where you can get, I can see where you can go and kind of early guidance early on. So, you know, Tiffany talked about how hard it was for her, um, you know, the struggle with all the different diets and, and everything else. One of the differences for us too, for me growing up in Trinidad, again, Trinidad 30 years ago, I'm not sure if it's like that now, was that from day one, there was so much in the way of mentorship. And I think it's important to get a little bit of that. Now, personal training is something people tend to look at as a little bit of elitist sometimes, but it does really, you know, it is worth it. It can save you, you know, decades of going the wrong way by having some good instruction. I'm not saying that to plug our services. I'm just saying in general. Um, but I think that's, that's something that's, that's really, really important. Another question we had was um, in regards to fasting and if there are times where it would be appropriate or, and or sustainable to include that in as part of a healthy lifestyle. Um, I struggle with that question for, for, for several reasons, only because I've never seen anybody normal when i say normal i mean not ridiculously driven athlete type able to do it in an environment where there's a super abundance of food um, intermittent fasting is something that i did when i was growing up sometimes not because i wanted to but because sometimes we just simply did not have enough food to eat as much as i would have liked to eat as a bodybuilder um, and it sucked and it was something that was only sustainable because it's how I had to eat. I have lots of friends, lots of um, brothers and sisters who I look at and, and work with, and have worked with over the years and in different countries. Um, and they do a form of intermittent fasting by default because they don't really have a choice. They don't really have um, that six meal a day thing that becomes so popular here in the West is not something that they're able to do. So they do a form of intermittent fasting kind of by default. And yes, they are able to um, get fantastic results. But the ones who've come to the United States and all of a sudden find themselves surrounded by all this food that you can get like this at your fingertips, they, they just can't sustain it anymore. They can't eat the way they used to. It's very, very difficult. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible. Um, I do tons of things that people say are impossible. So I know see people do the impossible many times, but it's like winning the lottery. You know, if you're buying a lottery ticket, you should be doing it because it's entertainment value. The likelihood of winning isn't really that high. I'm not saying you can't win, but it's unlikely. And I think we just kind of think that way in terms of intermittent fasting. Is it something that's sustainable? 
I'm not exactly sure in this particular environment. I think if you're an advanced athlete or someone who has gone through um, tremendous training in terms of discipline and being able to, to, to eat a certain way in controlled ways that maybe it's something you could probably do, but long-term, um, for the general population, I wouldn't recommend it. And again, intermittent fasting is something, it's not new. You know, we have millions, if not almost a billion people doing it, you know, every year during Ramadan. And I've worked with, and you know, coming from Trinidad as well, worked even from the beginning of my career, people going through Ramadan. And that's a huge form of intermittent fasting where they don't eat anything at all from sunrise to sunset. And at the end of Ramadan, weight gain is almost inevitable. You know, and there's so many studies that kind of show that. And there's so many studies that show that when people fast, that there tends to be that point where your body says, you know what, we need to eat. And then there's the overcompensation. And with intermittent fasting too, it's difficult because you, you know, you kind of evading, I see that you kind of like evading the, the problem. You're saying, all right, you know what, eating healthy is difficult, just not gonna eat as opposed to learning the skills that you need to learn. And some of the things that Erica mentioned, which is being able to, you know, learn the social skills to not eat, or eat the wrong foods in certain situations, you know, to be where what Tiffany said, which is learn how to, don't expect big results all the time, just small, small baby steps. That's good enough. Yeah, I think, I hope, that, I'm so sorry. If you no, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I think, but what I, so what I'm gathering from what you said and like my personal experience is the bounce back is really what the issue is, is I, I think anyone can have a certain conviction after a certain point, but unless it's to almost like a religious standpoint, whereas with Ramadan, like that's actually, there, there are religious reasons that people who, um, who honor that have for fasting and unless you're, I believe, unless you're able to have that same sort of conviction with fasting on a regular basis, there's no way to do it in a sustain, sustainable way, just because our natural human urges are we're starving ourselves in those times. And you want to, your body is craving everything that you've now starved from it. Um, yeah, that's my, that's also been my personal experience with it is when I, I would fast easily, like, and it's, e it, it can be easy depending on your, like, motivation level and whatever. For me, it was quite easy for me to just be like, okay, I'm not going to eat from 6 p.m. till like 2 p.m. the next day. And for me, that was easy. But then a couple months later, I would be like, okay, no, I'm really, really hungry. You know, so that's really what it is, is it's coming down to sustainability. And unless you have almost like a religious conviction to it, it's hard to make that sustainable. Um, I don't know if we have any more questions. Those are, that's the the last one that I, I saw so far. Anybody else have any questions? What would be, you know, are there health benefits truly, really and truly to intermittent fasting? Does it help your results in any way? And only, if, only if you're, here's, here's the thing, and I'm gonna be, you know, this whole seminar and anyone who knows me knows that I'm very straightforward. If you're eating crap, and you're eating things that are bad for your body and you eat less of it, there's a benefit and that's it. Are you resting your liver? No, you can't rest your liver. Can you, are you resting your organs? No, you can't rest your organs. Organs don't rest. Whether you're eating or not, they're still working. There's not, you can't detoxify from the idea of what detoxification really would be by stopping eating a particular point in time all you can do is just avoid certain foods. If you're doing intermittent fasting, but still eating all the wrong foods and thinking, well, you know, eating all the wrong foods, but you know, I'm eating a short periods of time. So therefore I'll lose weight. And that's the other thing too, in that health is not in the equation. The equation is, you know, weight loss equals whatever, 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 you know, and in whatever, whatever, whatever it is never multiplied by health in there never in that equation. So, 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 so the answer is, unless it's you're eating, if you're eating less junk food, sure. But benefit wise, um, low calorie diets are not 
bad if it's sustainable. I mean, we can, we can do pretty well health-wise on a low-calorie diet, but we have to be realistic about the fact that given the fact that we do have a superabundance of food in this part of the world, it is impractical to think that someone will be able to sustain it. Any other questions? Okay, so I would like to really and truly thank everyone for coming out. You know, we really and truly appreciate um, your taking time out of your day. And we are gonna be doing this on a monthly basis. So um, we'll probably announce the next seminar within a couple of days that we really and truly look forward to seeing everyone here back. And, you know, if anybody has any questions at any point in time, you can contact me on Instagram at Naturally Intense. You can contact Erica, Instagram at Erica Citrin. Contact Tiffany, Instagram at Tiffany Mangus. And I was really nice and put their Instagram handles on there, but didn't put mine on. I'm Naturally Intense. And I would really and truly appreciate having you guys back. And thank you so much for, for showing up. And I am Kevin Richardson. This is Erica Citrin. This is Tiffany Mangus. And together we are Naturally Intense Personal Training, wishing you all the best. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks again for everybody. Bye.